Good day, everyone, or good night, depending on where you're calling in from. My name is Zain Ahmed, and I'm the heart of, um, I'm the director, of the editor in chief, sorry, of Demo Music Magazine, which is an offshoot of the Hard House uh, Student Music Committee. Before introducing our guest speakers, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, this land has been the traditional territory of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. So, the Hard House Student Music Committee is pleased to present this evening's discussion on answering the open-ended question on what the future of live music is today. The panel will focus on the current state of uncertainty that's surrounding the performing arts industry, the challenges ahead for live music, and novel solutions that have been developed by artists and arts organizations during the, pa the pandemic. I'm grateful for the chance to be moderating this panel alongside my friend and event co-planner and just all around great person, Erin Lee. Tonight's event will begin with a moderated discussion until 6.15, at which point we'll open up the floor for any questions you may have. During the discussion, I'm a, I must ask that everyone keeps their mics muted and holds their questions until the end. Um, when it comes to questions, you can either just ask them in the chat and then we can answer those later, or you could also use the raise hand function. So without further ado, let's introduce tonight's speakers. First off, we have Charlotte Cornfield, who is a songwriter and multi-instrumentalist from Toronto. She holds a degree in jazz performance from Concordia University with a specialization in drums. Her third and most recent full-length album, The Shape of Your Name, was released to critical acclaim and was long listed for the 2019 Polaris Prize. Charlotte has toured with Broken Social Scene, Tim Baker, Anais Michelle, uh, Mitchell, and Sam Amidon, and has collaborated as a side musician with Tim Darcy, Leif Volbeck, Old Man Ludek, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, and Joel Plaskett, among others. Her songs have appeared on the Australian television show Offspring and in the short films of Amy Jo Johnson. She's very involved in Toronto's music scene and is currently a member of the Toronto Music Industry Advisory Council. Next, we have Dwayne Dixon, who has more than 15 years of experience in the arts, as well as in the corporate and entertainment sectors. In 2016 and 2017, he was executive director of the NIA Center for the Arts, a youth or arts organization focused on helping young black artists. Dwayne also produced NIA's first large scale multidisciplinary arts festival, Blow Up Fest. From 2013 to 2015, he was the executive director of Manifesto Community Projects, where among his achievements, he produced Canada's largest hip hop and urban arts festival at uh, Young and Dundas Square in Toronto. His very career has seen him produce, host, and program radio shows, and he served on the board of directors of Urban Music Association of Canada and Rise Entertainment as a pro oh, edutainment as a program committee member for Prolo Prologue Performing Arts. In 2017, Duane was the recipient of the Afro Global Television Excellence Award for Heritage. Last and certainly not least, Amy got. Am I pronouncing it right? Is it Gotung? Gotung? Okay. Amy is a creative programmer, producer, consultant, and writer based in Toronto, Canada. She has led complex projects and large teams for platforms ranging from XR media to long form documentary to festivals and hackathons. From 2016 to 2020, she served as executive director of Toronto's underground music and art series, Long Winter. With Long Winter and partners across the world, she's currently facilitating an international cross-sector festival and research program around urban space for DIY scenes. Amy holds an MA in musicology from the University of Toronto. She interrogates and experiments with curious people, making provocative world building systems focused work wherever she can find them. So welcome to everyone and thank you for joining us. To begin, the first question is going to go to Charlotte. Um, Charlotte, while the live music scene makes its transition towards online platforms for the near future, what's your take on how that changes the deliverance of performances? And also, I was wondering if you could speak to uh, this is questions for everyone to your favorite venues that have been affected by the pandemic. So Charlotte, I'll let you go. Yeah, so I'll answer your first question first, which is it's been really interesting this over the course of the past year to see the evolution of live streaming um, and how quickly people started doing it and how quickly tools uh, were developed that made it better and um, easier access to kind of higher production levels. So I think I really feel like live streaming is something that is here to stay. Um, and I think that I predict, I mean, I'm not, not an expert by any means, but that we're going to see um, a kind of hybrid model of shows that are 
partially in person, but also live streamed because there, there is an accessibility piece. A lot of people who either live off the beaten path or aren't able to access venues um, easily are now able to see these concerts and for a lower price in a lot of cases than, it, than a normal ticket would cost. So um, I'm just really curious to see what happens with the hybrid um, of the two. And, um, and I'm also just really curious to see sort of when and how shows start happening again, because we're definitely not there yet. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Just yeah. Um, I've, so I'm interested in your perspective as a musician, because I know a lot of um, musicians who I've spoken to aren't really big fans of sort of live streaming. They feel that it doesn't really capture the same sort of energy as, you know, a live performance. Um, and I was wondering what, um, how you feel about it. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, well, just speaking from my experience doing them, cause like, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic sort of last spring, I did a few and I felt like it was really cool to like, be able to connect with people in that way and get a bit of that live vibe. But I was just like, okay, I don't have really nice gear. I, I just felt like it wasn't nearly the type of quality of a show that I would be able to do if I had like tech assistance and help from a sound person and a venue and nice lighting. But then I've seen people like, for example, um, last week, I think it was last week I watched um, the Toronto artist, The Weather Station. She sort of marketed her show as a live stream, but she actually pre-recorded it. Um, and she had a 10 piece band in a really nice studio. Sound quality was really great. Um, it was like a really great production and I, I, I was really blown away by that show. And I think I've, I've seen live streams that are really great. And I do think that production piece is a big part of it. And so without that, um, and a lot of people aren't able to access that level of production without that, it's really hard to achieve that like same kind of live show experience. And I think, I think everyone can agree that nothing really compares to be being there in person and, and the, the live thing. But I do think it's a very positive thing to be able to do without the option. Um, and Amy can probably speak to that more than me because I know that she's produced some, like is producing like an online festival basically right now. So. Yeah, Amy, if you um, would want to speak to that, that would be great also. Yeah, to, sorry, to the, um, I lost the initial thought, is it to the benefit of of uh, digital or? So, sort of, we were speaking to the experience um, of it and how people are sort of like putting on these whole shows um, with regards to that. So yeah, just, I, uh, I know you're putting on a festival as Charlotte just said. So what, what are your thoughts on sort of like live streaming as an alternative to like live performances? Uh, right, and yeah, v, the V, the live V digital virtual um, question. Yeah, um, yeah, it's not, obviously it's not the same. <laughs> um, to say nothing new, nothing will replace live, nothing can replace live. Um, it, but yeah, similar to Charlotte, I, I am ultimately like assuming that there's gonna be a return, which I think, is pretty safe to sure, you know a return of some sort. Um, I'm pretty excited ultimately by what this added layer now um, results in for all of us because now it's like we have much better systems for doing uh, for producing the the digital stuff that can be an add-on to anything now, which increases access obviously for um, audiences, but also opportunity for performers and um, festivals, et cetera, certainly helps for bookers. Like you don't have to, dealing with like archival recordings and like, you know, trying to get a good sense of, of what a musician's gonna be like live used to be, you know, for better or worse, uh, depending on who the musician was and how good their materials were, it could be very difficult, especially if you were dealing with a musician who, who hadn't, didn't have a lot of, um, great resources in that regard. Um, and you sort of had to rely on word of mouth and you know, um, you can't always tell from a recording what the artist is gonna be like live. Anyway, that's all to say that um, uh, it's gonna be, it's pretty amazing the access that this now opens up and the fact that we can all uh, 
you know, check each other out and um, market development opportunities, it seems like are going to open up in a real way as a result of, of that extra layer, um, which is which is pretty exciting. I could speak more to to digital, but actually I'd like to hear from Duane um, around all of this, who has a much better sense of the full uh, scope of things. Yeah, for sure, Duane, um, if you want to speak to that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's challenging. Uh, both Charlotte and Amy have, have touched on it. Nothing will replace live as we know. Um, but it's it's interesting because what I've seen in, in speaking with uh, you know organizations and artists, uh, musicians that have been affected across the province, the challenge that I'm hearing and I'm seeing as well, you know, after being, you know, uh, serving a full day in front of my camera, in front of a screen, having meetings, you know, music, live music was a way for me to get away from everything, unplug, if you will, and, and really interact and support with, uh, get into the stage with the artist. With it being on screen, a couple things. So you lose that live element, we know that. Um, but it's also just, you know, saturating the market, right? So not only are you competing with other musicians, you're still competing with Netflix, right? You're still competing with these other streaming services. And um, it's, it's, been, it's been challenging. Um, the exciting part about it is uh, other platforms that are being used by musicians that may have been traditionally um, suited for gamers, you know, and and, and music uh, musicians are finding a way to uh, utilize the best platforms for them to get that best experience and really connect with, with their audience. And, and that's the biggest thing that um, I think musicians, artists still wanna hold on to and uh, rightfully so. And that's that interaction that you, you would get just by being on stage, just by walking on stage, that energy that helps propel you, you know, that call and response that you do with the audience hard to do if you're asking somebody to put up a fire emoji or something, you know? Um, I think that's great. I think both Dwayne, Charlotte, Amy, everything that you guys talked about, it really addressed how you're right, live music cannot be replaced by things online. But at the same time, um, I was wondering if you guys could speak again a little bit more about the opportunities that exist now for emerging artists because of all the different platforms and like the technology that exists today, how that might help people. Um, just share their music more holistically than having to like find venues or people to take a chance on them. And this is open-ended for anyone. Um, I'll finish my thought then. I, I think I'll say um, the benefits I see with any artist emerging or seasoned is, you know, learning the, the equipment, uh, utilizing a home studio to perfect that sound. Um, uh, increasing your your tech skills, you know, when it comes to producing this this these music, uh, this music, excuse me, um, and these shows, right? You're learning skills that are going to be transferable in your life. Um, while right now, again, it feels daunting to have to learn that new skill, and you just want to get out there and jam and 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 play. I think um, by the time you know everything settles down and we're in some sort of normalcy, um, a, a a new world, if you will. I think those skills are gonna be invaluable to the uh, uh, benefit of everyone that loves live music. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think what this pandemic has created is just a forced acknowledgement that we are living in a tech hybrid world where a lot of things are virtual instead of real now, but um, to take a step back and I guess reminisce for now, uh, and this goes for everyone, can I ask about your favorite news? that you are nostalgic about or that have been affected by the pandemic? Dwayne, if you, if you wanna go first about your favorite venues. Sure. And favorite, sorry, I, can you repeat that? Favorite? Oh, your favorite venues. Oh, venues. I mean, who? I, I, I don't think I could pick one. Um, That's but, okay, dude. But here's what I'll say about, about venues. Uh, I won't pick one, but it was disturbing um, pre-pandemic, you know, that uh, the threat of live music and venues closing in the city of Toronto. So, so the, what the pandemic has done is exasperated, you know, the, the, the challenges that were already faced by venue owners. Um, you know, oftentimes, you know, especially if I'm coming from a, uh, my background is as a, as a performing artist was as a hip hop artist. And, and a lot of these smaller venues um, were, extremely important for the development and sustainability of, 
of the urban music genre and all, all that it entails uh, to develop yourself, find your voice, find your, your, your presence on stage uh, and continue to develop that as you develop your career and grow. Uh, without that, um, it's, it's harder, especially for, uh, in, from my perspective, for urban acts to, to hit those larger stages uh, if and when they, they are able to stay around. So um, uh, yeah, I won't name any specific venues, but uh, it, it's, it's been troubling uh, and the pandemic has exasperated uh, that. I completely agree. I mean, all these venues, they, they, they take a chance on emerging artists and they give them a platform that's, that's hard to do for, for larger spaces. And it's, it's really sad that that doesn't exist right now. Um, Charlotte, Amy, if you guys want to speak to that as well. Yeah, I mean, um, just like coming from the Toronto Music Advisory Council perspective, um, going off of what Dwayne was saying before the pandemic, we were already in like emergency mode with venues, like trying to figure out because there was something like seven venue closures in Toronto in 2019. And then this year we've already lost Mod Club, which is a really important venue. Um, the boat and round venue, which were also connected to what Dwayne was saying, really important spaces for people um, at an emerging artist level to kind of like get their foot in the door and um, and sort of like get used to playing live and, and in front of audiences. And then, yeah, and now a bunch are, are hanging by a thread and there are some um, venue folks who, are, who have been very vocal and who have kind of like banded together. But um, yeah, I think all of these venues like hold a place in my heart because like part of what I love about living in Toronto is being able to um, just like go out to any of these places that we've mentioned and a bunch more and just catch a really awesome show. Like it's such a special thing about being in the city. So um, yeah, I think I, I'm, I feel connect, connected to them all in some ways. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, when you mentioned the boat, that was the first venue that I went to as soon as I turned 19. I remember seeing all these local bands and I was like, oh, this is so cool, it's so exciting. Like, I can't wait to discover the live scene. And, you know, I guess for a lot of the people who are around my age, it's kind of like a missed window of opportunity. So it's really great to hear you speak to that. Um, Amy, if you have any thoughts, that'd be great. I can move on to the next question. Um, yeah, I don't have a, a lot to add. It. I, I left a little link in the chat for unfortunately not great news, but for anyone who does want to look at some of the background to what the other panelists were talking about. But um, yeah, it's it's absolutely a crisis. I mean, it was it, it, local venues were facing a crisis before this hit. Um, so it's yeah, it's it's very much a real issue. Um, I know that TMAC and others are working, Toronto Music Advisory Council that Charlotte was talking about and others are, are working to try to um, Canada Music Live has been doing a lot of work to try to support local venues um, nationally, um, but there's certainly in a place like Toronto where rent was already difficult and the residential structure here is so dense and that can also make um, operating as a venue difficult. Um, it, it's not, yeah, it, it's not an easy, not an easy place to, at the best of times. Um, and during a time when everything had to shut down Almost basically completely for a year. Um, venues were some of the hardest hit in the sector. Um, so just another, just another plug for um, keep, you know, those of those of us who care about music, live music, who care about the local scene, which is I'm sure absolutely everyone on this call, um, keep your eyes and ears open for ways to support um, getting venues getting presenter spaces, getting venues back up and running or connected with new spaces, making all of making a sort of rebuild um, of the local infrastructure possible because those venues are beyond crucial um, to the development of, of, local, of the local scene and local talent and for opportunities for audiences, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, thank you so much um, for all the insight you guys provided um, on that. Uh, I have a question specifically for Dwayne, because I know you were recently appointed interim music officer at the Ontario Arts Council. First of all, congratulations 
Um, and I know you're working to guide applicants through OAC's music programs. I was wondering if you've noticed anything interested or concerning about like with regards to applications as a result of the pandemic and what the OAC is sort of doing to deal with that. Oh, you're muted again. Uh, yeah, thank you for um, the congratulations. And um, yeah, so I've, I've, I've noticed quite a bit actually since I've been at the OAC. Um, one is the sheer number of applications that come into the OAC uh, has gone up slightly. Uh, I believe some of that is, is due to you know the pandemic. Uh, and in this coming round of deadlines, I believe uh, that that's gonna be a trend that will continue. Um, you know, a lot of uh, the OAC, we've made, you know, our presentation program, so music production and presentation, which supports, you know, live presentation of music and musicians, we've added, you know, the virtual component to it. Uh, because again, we now know um, that's, that comes, you know, with the territory in terms of uh, performing, as we've talked about a bit earlier. Um, some of the interesting things I've, I've noticed, you know, at the close, and I know we're talking about live music, but I do think it's all, all interconnected. Uh, a lot of musicians are recording from home. Um, that, that is what I've noticed. Um, a lot, you know, are, are collaborating virtually and they're sending recording files, stems back and forth to ensure uh, the quality is still there, but they're finding new ways to, to record. Um, and it is a learning process, you know. Uh, some artists, you know, absolutely love it. Others feel like it's it's taking away from the creative process, uh, much like we've talked about with live music. Um, uh, things that the OAC is doing, in addition to that, is you know we we launched an artist response in initiative last year, and what that was was to, we've taken you know some funding from. Uh, two core programs, you know, our touring and market development, which were limited due to the pandemic in terms of traveling and, and created this arts response initiatives for, to help, you know, individuals, uh, collectives and organizations uh, through this pandemic with what they feel they would need to support them uh, in sustaining their career. And uh, a, a large majority for music has been about, you know, supporting or supporting the purchase of home studio equipment you know, uh, courses to learn some of these studio equipment, uh, how to use this, this equipment. So I think that's, that's important, uh, but it's also a trend that I'm keeping my eye on as, you know, if we get to the troubling part of, of the conversation, uh, right now, let's take music recording projects, for example, or even music presenta uh, production and presentation. The success rate uh, for music production and presentation is about 30%. Uh, for music recording, uh, the success rate is about, you know, anywhere between 13 and 16% as it was with this last round. So my fear is, you know, with, with most people being home and now looking at funding opportunities, uh, the submissions will probably increase, you know, the number of applicants that actually apply to the program. And if we're not getting additional funding, um, it's going to be harder to support all of the applications that come through. Um, so, you know, this is, this is something that myself and my colleagues in the music office and across the OAC will, uh, you know, we're keeping an eye on and we'll absolutely uh, have discussions, continue our conversations on how we can pivot um, to support the industry when we know uh, it's, it's, it's going to need it for this year and probably uh, years to come. Thank you. I think the points that you brought up are very, like, important to consider, especially from almost like the back end of things, because a lot of the participants here, and we don't understand the production that goes into music, we're kind of just like audience members like, wow, like this is so fun to, to watch. And I think that's really important to consider. And I also really appreciate that even though the pandemic has created very firm and constricting boundaries, there's been a lot of flourishment within that. And like, what can we do? How can, what are creative solutions for that? And I think you really outlined a lot of that. And that's really cool to see. Um, this next question is again, open-ended. So anyone can answer if they want to. Uh, how do you maintain a sense of community online? How do you collaborate in virtual spaces? What happens locally versus globally, which can happen now? Maybe Amy, if you wanna go first. <laughs> Sure. Um, yeah, I've, uh, uh, it's been hard. <laughs> That's my summary. Um, 
so yeah, so I work with a um, one community community collective driven organization, Long Winter. We use Slack to communicate, and that's so you know we've been able to continue that. And as Charlotte was mentioning, you know, put on a, a digital season. Um, so we've been able to you know maintain contact in that way. Um, yeah, it's an interesting time. Very curious to hear what the other panels have to say about this. I, um, I found in some ways it's like um, it, the opportunity of this time has been, I think that it's easier, it can be easier to get in touch with people than it was before. Maybe not with people like Dwayne. <laughs> Imagine Dwayne spends, you know, 10 hours a day on back-to-back -back calls. Um, but, uh, but for other, you know, for bookers, for, for, for agents, for folks that um, just all of a sudden have a lot of time on their hands or, you know, if, even in trying to book, like I'm trying to book now for summer, like outdoor shows. And it's like, it's kind of like the best time to be booking because no one's on tour <laughs> in a way. Right. So you, you sort of, um, so you have access to people and, you know, I've had, I've had relationships, you know, even like re community relationships in the music world, both, you know, professional and like, like um, coll collegial, friend, you know, friend wise, um, you know, I guess blossom at this time, you know, in, just in terms of having long conversations and that sort of thing with, um, so I guess that's been cool that you, you can go deep with some people, I guess, in a way that we couldn't before, but as someone who was like pretty connected to the local scene before, it's such an alienating, like isolating time. Um, and so much of how things work locally is just like you show up to a show, you, you see some stuff, you, you know, you hear some stuff, you talk to some people, you, it, it's like, it's, it's very much about just like meeting. I mean, that's what cities are for, right? Meeting in spaces and colliding and, and that's how, different projects form and, and make up and break up and all those things. And, um, and that's just been, you know, everyone's, I feel like everyone's sort of like gone into their own, their own little, uh, holes, <laughs> um, their, their sort of individual arenas. And again, like people, the interesting thing is people have clustered together in that way, both online and through presenting, like with like, you know, there still have been like shows and especially over the summer, like um, sometimes less advertised things. And there just, there's definitely has been like a scene happening, um, but it happens in more siloed ways. Um, and I personally like really miss the collisions of, of a like IRL um, scene. So that's my thought on that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's almost like, you know, you did say you can connect online, but it's hard to connect in person with the people from local live scenes. It's kind of like a trade-off with that. Um, Charlotte, if you want to go into detail about connecting with people online. Yeah, I'm sort of, I, I agree with everything that, that Amy was saying. Um, it is really not the same as the spontaneity that happens when you're at a big show or even a small show and you, it's people outside of the community that you're, used to sometimes. So I do feel like, although there are things happening, um, they they do feel like, like Amy said, kind of siloed into various groups, scenes, groups of friends. So I do really miss that, uh, that sort of like spontaneity and just randomly connecting with people. But at the same time, I do feel like the people I know sort of in my community, the people, like Dwayne was saying, have really taken it upon themselves to sort of like learn new skills, develop new ideas, come up with things uh, that might not have happened were it not for this super bizarre year that we've had. So for example, some friends of mine um, decided to start an internet radio station and asked me to help out with that. So we're like working on that project right now. And I don't think that would have happened. It, I think all those people would have been on the road and really busy. Um, were it not for the pandemic. So I do think there are these kind of other things happening. It's definitely not the same, but the internet and um, audio tools and video and everything does make it a lot easier than it ever was to kind of connect in this way. Absolutely, that makes that makes a lot of sense. And uh, Dwayne, if you'd like to. 
Yeah, there not much more I, I'll, I'll I'll need to add. Uh, Charlotte, Amy, touch it all. Um, but I'll highlight that spontaneity piece. Uh, I really feel that from Charlotte. Uh, that that's to me what you know is the crux of art and and relationships between audience and and performers. Right? Is is that that reaction that you get um, that it's hard harder in this virtual context. Absolutely, and I'm not a musician myself, but I think there, like, for example, improvisation jam sessions, that all happens through in real life interactions when musicians come together and just the music comes alive. And that's hard to recreate online when you, when you plan it, you know, that spontaneity, I, I fully agree. And uh, I think Zane, you're taking that. Yeah, um, while, I mean, while it is hard to sort of replicate that sense of spontaneity, I think, in virtual spaces, we, um, I was wondering, because I think now a lot of people are also putting out so much great output um, or coming up with new ideas and unique ways of doing things. Um, so since in this time, have there been any exciting collaborations that any of you have had a chance to be a part of um, that you'd like to speak to? Um, whoever, uh, Dwayne, if you wanna pick up from this one, um, if there's been anything. Uh, collaborations. Uh, no, I think I'll, I'll leave that to, um, uh, you know, my artist friends uh, oh, <laughs> the other side in terms of collaborations. All right. Um, Charlotte, would you, have you had any exciting collaborations? Um, I've had, like, not in the sense of I made this thing with this person. I, I did, like, I have done some kind of co-writing via zoom and audio movers sessions with people that have been fun but definitely there have been like some connections that like for example uh i did this banff center online residency in january um and one of the sort of like mentor folks was shad and he and i have been in the same space like many times but we didn't know each other and he kind of like lives up the street from me but just ha being able to connect with him and get like an hour of albeit on Zoom, but like face-to-face -face time. Um, there, there are some things like that that have just been like really rewarding and cool. Um, yeah, that I've just like really appreciated. Yeah, the, the band presidency sounds really cool. Even that, like, I mean, the, I guess instead of saying collaborations, just I guess opportunities uh, would have been a better word for me to use at the same time. Um, but that, that sounds really amazing. Um, Amy, have you, um, had an exciting I mean you're doing the the festival which sounds amazing I've I've tr like weirdly I've like kind of never been busier I'm actually working on a lot of things right now uh maybe this is not obvious but they're all for they're all to come um and some of them are things that were supposed to happen you know during the pandemic and just kept getting pushed and pushed and um so one of those, I can't talk about a lot of them because they're not announced yet, but I will say that one of them is, uh, relates to the TTC as a music project with the TTC. Um, so keep your ears open for that. We're dropping an announcement probably in September at this point. Um, and, uh, and, then, uh, and then I'm one like challenging and fun and interesting project that I've been working on has been this international festival that was supposed to happen last spring got pushed um, and now we ended up like sort of distributing it um, and so we're going to be running like a live uh, a live portion here it's with collaborators in Paris so there's going to be live events here live events in Paris um, both uh, multi-channel events um, that will be streamed. So they'll, they'll be like party here, party there, and then the virtual party to tap in that way. This is um, a, a collaboration with Club Quarantine and, and others. So, so groups that are really familiar with working in this realm, um, in the virtual realm. And speaking of like a group that's done really well in terms of like taking advantage of um, using the medium to, the, to their advantage rather than trying to fit a square peg in a round hole, which is what a lot of what we saw, I think, early on was streaming. Um, anyway, so it's a similar model, like multi-cam, um, multi-site, multi-artist. Um, so I'm I'm excited about that thing that's coming together, um, and also doing a bunch, planning a bunch of like pop-up shows in in various um, outdoor locations this summer. 
So I'm excited about that, but I'm also meanwhile trying to, you know, plan and deliver a festival for the end of 2021 that could take place in, you know, five different formats or possibly get pushed again. And this would be, this is now the fifth pivot that this one, this one project is a pretty big project, but this one project has now endured. So anyway, so I'm tired, <laughs> um, but I'm also, it's also been, there's also been something like really great about, uh, I guess, inspiring about like going through all of this together with, with so many partners and just, you know, you, I, I think I said in the chat too, like it's, it's been rough, but also the solidarity that we've had in the community professionally and just among people who are, uh, who are trying to make music happen in some way, in any way that they can has been um, really uh, emboldening. Um, that all sounds so incredible. Um, and I like that you spoke to Club Quarantine also because I, I'm a fan of Club Quarantine and what they've been doing. I think they're so innovative. Um, I've attended quite a few of their, uh, their music nights and like in the, during lockdown 1.0, I guess we'll call it uh, a year ago, they were one of my only sources of joy. I had such, so much fun with it. Um, that's great. I'm really excited for the live concert, the, the international pair, that, that sounds amazing. Um, and I think Aram has a, a question now. Uh, yeah, I do. I do. I just want, I do just want to add though, uh, Amy, that sounds amazing. It does sound like you're really, really busy. Like those all sound like really cool projects. I don't know why I was imagining for the TTC thing that you mentioned, maybe like, oh, you've arrived at Queens Park and it's like a wrap this time, maybe like a operatic. <laughs> That's definitely not it. I just, <laughs> but um, so my next question is for Charlotte. And you've done so many things during the pandemic as well. They've been so interesting. Um, and I'm wondering, how do you, do you, is there like a pressure to always be producing or creating art music during the pandemic? And if so, how do you deal with that? Yeah, I think even outside of the pandemic, like the, with this sort of like social media world that we live in, there is this kind of inherent pressure to constantly have output. And one thing that's been really interesting uh, to me about the pandemic is the sort of um, all the logistical and admin stuff that I would normally be doing that for tours, for things that were coming up, all of which got canceled. Um, all of a sudden I had more time to actually just like create for the sake of creating. And that's my own personal experience. I know everyone had a totally, has had a totally different experience of the pandemic. Some people are working full time. Some people have kids at home and just don't have that space to create. Um, but I can't, I don't know if I'm like straying from, from the question. I, I feel like most of my pressure to create comes from myself. And, um, and so this time I've really like tapped into the, been able to have sort of more time to work on stuff and figure out how I work and what I need to work on um, in terms of creative process and output. So yeah, so it's been a contemplative and productive time in that way. I think that's beautiful. And I think like the time now when you know all of your projects are kind of pushed back, you kind of hone in on the process of like, why do I love creating music? You know, like, and you're doing it just to have fun. Um, I think that's great. And Zane, back to you. Yeah, for sure. Um, this is a question for everyone again. I'm just wondering what resources have been useful for you guys as you've been developing performance opportunities? Um, and I guess, Dwayne, I know I pick on you every time to go first, but I'm gonna have to pick on you again. <laughs> yeah, um, what resources? Well, and I'll speak from, again, I'm speaking from an OEC perspective. So I'll speak with, you know, what I'm hearing from, from artists and collaborators. And um, I'd say, I'd say that the creative interaction, so we've talked about, you know, audiences and, and losing that, uh, spontaneity and that energy that they give us, uh, but there's other platforms out there, you know, in so in the social media world that are now, you know, becoming uh, a tool that can can really bring uh, an artist's music to life, right? In ways that an artist probably hadn't thought about before. Uh, becoming viral, you know, with your song playing in the background is 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 what I'm thinking of. You know, I think about. Um, 
you know, Cardinal Official, right? And he had a chart topping song uh, called Dangerous with Akon, uh, probably, wow, probably about a ten, 10 years ago now. That seems long. Anyway, um, it's now becoming a thing on TikTok, right? And it's it's starting to, to chart again. And and this is ways in which I don't believe, you know, when he made the music, obviously when any artist creates, uh, you think you're creating the best music and it's gonna have longevity. Um, but I think we all think about, you know, a project and it having a timeline and, and you're putting resources behind it to promote. And once that ends, you're moving on to the next project and you'll put resources behind that project and your discography remains in, in the past and people can access it and find it. Um, but I don't believe, you know, the thought process was it would, you know, start charting again. And I believe that's what's happening uh, to him and other musicians because of this, you know, um, these platforms that are out there that's now uh, causing us to react and interact in different ways and new ways. Uh, so I think that's, those are, those are some extreme benefits for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I have, uh, Charlotte and Amy, I'm gonna ask you guys to also comment on it if um, possible. And then I have another question that I've really been thinking about so much recently, and I think it's a perfect opportunity to ask it. Um, but before getting to it, I'm not gonna jump the gun. Um, Amy, if you would like to speak to the same um, sort of question about what resources have been useful for you uh, in developing uh, performance opportunities. Um, I'm sorry to say I don't have any like great answers to this. I mean, I, in terms of like some seminal like website or book or something, um, just paying attention to, <laughs> trying to pay attention to what's happening, trying to really pay attention to like what I actually am willing to like what I stick around to listen to and in what forms and, and like I'm a very tough audience I'm like high ADD like I'm not, I'm not so good with the screen stuff so I feel like I'm a good test case for like what's what's gonna fly like if it's something that I stuck around for then it's probably um it's probably worth doing so that's yeah like people have more or less interest in the digital um, I, I found it really just useful to like talk to peers and the, you know, like the networks of support, like, um, various, yeah, just calling people and chatting with, you know, who did, who have done stuff that I was like, okay, I liked this. How, how did this work for you? Oh my God. The number of, the number of emails being exchanged right now among the presenter community about platforms, presenting platforms and like ways to monetize, like it's, nuts <laughs> so i could give you i could definitely give you a list of like 50 but there's there's no like one answer i find it's like it depends on what you want to do and there are all these things to consider what kind of experience you want for your audiences um what kind of artists you're presenting like uh how flexible do you want it to be how custom customizable do you want it to be um so yeah so i'm just i just try to like same as in the the pre-pandemic times just keep my eyes and ears open for stuff that I like stuff that I don't like so much and try to learn from what other folks are doing. Yeah, that's, that's that makes sense. But um, yeah, thank you for that uh, answer. Uh, Charlotte, uh, last but not least, what um, resource has been useful for you? Um, yeah, also, the, I'm not sure exactly how to answer this, but but like Amy said, just kind of this, this solidarity, just being able to talk to people ask them what they're doing, what's working for them, how they've kind of uh, pivoted to, to trying other things um, and tying into what Dwayne was saying. Um, just, yeah, like the, uh, it seems like the process of recording um, and learning all this stuff has been democratized to the point where gear is, there's very affordable gear out there. There's YouTube tutorials for every single piece of equipment and um yeah and every like i feel like so many of the people i know like i didn't really i i was very like tech avoidant and then during the pandemic i was like i'm gonna just learn how to record on garage band with a little cheap interface and that's been like such a freeing process for me so i think um yeah i think there's just like so much so much out there to access if, if you want it there's just so much information which is great. Yeah, that's that's amazing. I've, I've been seeing sort of a, like, at least online, 
so many people who have sort of started producing music and like taking this time on GarageBand and platforms like that because they're so much more accessible. Um, speaking to accessibility in music, this was when Dwayne brought up TikTok. I have to ask this question for everyone. Um, in your eyes, have online platforms like TikTok because the hold it has on the industry is kind of scary at this point, uh, for me at least. Has it cheapened or devalued art in your eyes or has it provided important outlets for making art more accessible? Um, whoever wants to answer that one first um, or speak to that. Charlotte, I guess we'll start with you since, um, yeah, if you're able to speak to that or have any um, thoughts on TikTok. I'm not the best person with TikTok because I don't know TikTok very well <laughs> at all. But I just, I know that, I guess what excites me about the idea of it is just it, it's all, all these people who don't necessarily consider themselves artists or maybe they do, but participating in a creative process and getting excited about making something and sharing it. And I think that's just a really healthy practice. So I think the more people that are doing that, I, that's really awesome. Yeah, that was, thank you. That's a really refreshing outlook on it. I've seen a lot of people just being like, the grip it has is so scary on the music, uh, on the charts even. Um, Amy, what are, do you have any thoughts on TikTok? I'm embarrassed to say that I similarly am not a, I'm not a big TikTok user. Um, but I am curious to hear from Dwayne on this one or, or like, any, kind of anyone who knows. I'm curious about the rights um, the rights, I'm not, I don't know how the rights work with TikTok. So I'm curious to hear that. Um, I did, I, in, in terms of what Charles was talking about. Yeah. Like I, I love, I mean, all the TikTok videos that I see, I was going to say retweeted, um, but that's not the term uh, that I see like repurposed elsewhere. So fun. Like I, I mean, I, I do love the, yeah, the, 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 the use of just like, you know, the, the digital meme of like repurposing and repurposing and then taking the smaller and smaller bit and doing all these and like making like this whole Gesamtkunstwerk that can come out of like the tiny, you know, the tiniest little snippet of things. Um, so that's super fun, but I don't know what the implications are in terms of rights and that sort of thing. I'm so curious to hear from Dwayne. Yeah, Zane. Uh, so, I mean, rights, I, I'm still learning about, about the rights to be quite honest. As everybody is transitioning online, uh, though that's probably the number one question um, I have with artists or they have with, of me, you know, can I speak to that? And, and right now I cannot, um, you know, we're learning, we're learning it as well. Uh, but Zane, you had brought up, you would, you would ask the question is, you know, does it cheapen uh, the art? Interesting question, because I've, I've, I've wrestled with that question as well. You know, I go back to, you know, my consumption of music and I recognize it was in a time that's pre-digital. Um, you know, I would go, I'd buy an album, uh, whether that be on cassette, that be CD or an actual vinyl. And, and that to me was a very intimate process, right? Like I'm, I'm looking at every track uh, on the album. I'm reading the, the liner notes to see who's getting shouted out. Uh, the credits, you know, is this producer, uh, oh, that producer was on this record. Okay, there's, you know, a similar sound. And, and that's how, what aided me in terms of getting educated uh, about the behind the scenes, you know, uh, of, of music and who's putting out the record, who, where, where is the label um, located? And believe me, I've, I was one of those guys who would roll up to, um, you know, Warner Music. Um, you know, um, if I was in New York, I'm, I'm going to Bad Boy Records, you know, because I can see the address here and I just want to see how to network, who to meet, et cetera. Um, that also to say, when you listen to music, it was a very intimate process. Now it feels as though, you know, it's, it's almost like cable or what cable was. Uh, it's accessible to us at any point. We can go and almost, you know, you subscribe to a streaming platform and you'll get access to, you know, millions and millions and millions of songs, um, which, is, which is great, but that does definitely change the experience, right? And it's, it's more casual, it's, it's, it's uh, tertiary, it's in, it's, in, it's in the background a lot, right? And, and I don't know if, if TikTok, I mean, I spoke about the uh, benefits, you know, the unintended benefits to the artist community and I use the example of Cardinal Official, uh, you know, so that that can definitely happen where next generation is is creating a dance or something to your music. Uh, and now you become relevant again in with that song, etc. 
So it, it has benefits, pros and cons, uh, but I think the jury is still out um, on whether it's going to, you know, hurt the consumption of music uh, or, or help it. Um, I think that was an incredibly insightful answer. Uh, that, thank you so much for that. I completely agree with what you mean. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm part of that generation that consumes music differently now. And how you describe consume music before the digital age as, age as very intimate and holistic and with a deep appreciation because it's a physical thing that you're consuming. You're going out, you're buying a CD, buying vinyl, and you're listening to the whole thing. I think that's beautiful. And at first, you know, with the whole TikTok, because it's cheap in it, it just music platforms in general, how accessible it is. I feel like because it's so accessible with what you're saying, um, it does, I guess, not cheapen the experience, but the way we appreciate the music is a little bit different. And I guess you're still, the, the jury is still out and whether that's good or bad, but I mean, to put TikTok again into an example, it's only 15, 60 seconds of a song at most on how we appreciate it. And what do we do in the background of that music? It's, it's very different. Um, well, thank you so much for the answer. And this is again for everyone here, the next question. Um, and it is a bit important, I think, especially right now. As music moves online, do you have any tips towards monetizing your work? Uh, Charlotte, if you could go first. For sure, I mean, I think like for anybody who wants to make a living for music through music, it's really important to just have an awareness of all of the different income streams that are out there. All of the different granting bodies, royalties, be registered for MROC and Sound Exchange and so can, because your income is going to be coming from multiple sources. And especially if without the live piece, um, those streams are going to be really important. So I would just say, talk to people, talk to other artists, managers, people who work in the industry um, about all of those different avenues, just so that you're aware and kind of registered for everything that you're eligible for, um, able to sign up for any of the sort of um, like lectures and free workshops that are out there just to because I think, I mean, I still have more, a lot more to learn on this front for sure, but just having an awareness of all those different avenues is really important. Yeah, I think that's a great point, just keeping everything open, being aware of all the different avenues, because um, local musicians that I know, it, the only hurdle in their mind is getting their music out there and getting people to listen to it. It's not even a question of like, I'm going to monetize it first, because it's hard, you know, the whole starving artist um, stereotype. Um, I'm just going to move on to the next question, which is for Amy. So while the pandemic has impacted the entire arts community, do you have any opinions on whether some art forms are more marketable and adaptable online during the pandemic? Um, yeah, uh, I mean, short answer, yes. <laughs> um, Short answer, yes, but I, I don't think, I mean, I think that what we've seen is, is that it's not always about the, did you say art form? It's not always about the form, but sometimes about how you use the, plat how you use the platform or how you use the media right to your advantage. Um, I mean, again, Club Q is a good example of like a movement that came up that, that took advantage of the, um, the forced, like trapped in your home digital um, experience and like actually built a whole um, platform around that and built a whole community around that. Um, and, uh, and there are like artists who have been doing really interesting things in, um, in virtual spaces. Um, like, you know, read the TikTok stuff, there's like create, there can be creative uses um, of those types of platforms. And then in, in terms of like, I mean, in terms of like getting to sort of touch on what Charlotte was talking about, getting compensated um, as much as you can, like wherever you can as an artist, take, a, take something into your own hands and take advantage of the platform to like get out ahead of things and, um, and, make, and utilize it to your own advantage in your own way. Um, uh, that's always great. And that's, that's, there's always possibility for that if you're like enterprising and um, creative with use of media. But um, yeah, I mean, obviously it's been like, I don't know, 
to speak more to like even just something as basic as like genre or ensemble like obviously this format has been easier for some folks than others if you're like a dj it's easier to maybe like stream a set from your basement than if you're in like a five piece um improvisational jazz ensemble or something like that um it's obviously been really hard for ensembles at this time to rehearse yada yada so um, so short answer is yes, um, it, uh, yes and, yes and, y yes but, yes there is, there are some forms that work better than others and but, you can always like, uh, you can be creative around how you use the, the medium and, um, and take advantage of, of opportunities that are there, I think. I think that's, I think that was a great answer and a great point and I mean, I have friends that are in that are pursuing their major in jazz right now and they're like how are we supposed to improv over zoom with like like oh is the audio lagging or are you kind of waiting half a beat <laughs> uh and zane i think you have the last question yeah um we're almost at the end of this panel and it's been so great so far um and i always like to sort of ask and i think to some degree this question definitely has been answered already but um we have seen significant innovation and experimentation within the world of art during the pandemic. And with that in mind, for everyone here, I guess, what will the future look like? Um, whether it be your own personal projects or what you forecast sort of the, the future of performance being um, in live, live spaces. So Charlotte, I'm gonna start with you this time. Yeah, I, I wish I could predict the future, but I, I don't know. I do think that once it's safe to gather again, people are going to be really excited about going to shows and getting together and play. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that, to like the joy of that. Um, in terms of like what the industry as a whole is going to look like, I mean, I do think that some things needed to change. Um, and this year has, has um, brought attention to that. Um, things like systemic racism and misogyny within the music industry, um, things like the unsustainability of touring at a, as a sort of an entry level artist and these tools to do stuff online um, are actually like really, really useful for people who can't afford to do a tour and bring their whole band with them. So yeah, so I'm, I'm just, I'm excited to see uh, what happens because it definitely was not a perfect world before this. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely. Uh, Dwayne, what are, what are your thoughts? Uh, I think, I think there will be, um, well, before I say that, I too wish I could predict the future, uh, <laughs> uh, but I cannot. Uh, however, I think it's gonna add more dimension. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, um, you had a fan club back in the day and it was so disconnected from real time. It was like you would send a letter and then the artist would respond or the artist team would respond months, maybe years later. That all seems to be happening real time now, you know? And I think those elements, even when uh, we return back to uh, in-person and live, uh, that will continue. Artists understand um, how important they've been within this, you know, isolation, right? Um, everyone is turning to music uh, or art in general, but people are turning to music to take their mind off of what's happening to them. Uh, you can find a song for anything. Uh, there was much like Club Q, Club Quarantine, uh, there was another platform that grew uh, as a result of, you know, uh, the quarantine, and that would be a platform called Versus. Uh, Versus, uh, it's produced by multi-platinum uh, American producers, Timberland and and Swiss beats and, and what it is based out of uh, a hip hop and uh, reggae battling type of form. So where artists compete, um, uh, creatively compete, you know, and they, they, they counteract each other with a song from their catalog. Uh, initially it started off as a battle, but it has evolved into really a celebration of music um, and getting insight into the artist's, you know, uh, mindset when they were creating said record. Um, and, and, and that, I think has been a win uh, for the artist community because uh, any artist, you know, whether you know you, you're relatively retired or um, you're you're active currently and at the peak of your career, uh, you get celebrated through this platform and 
And those artists have seen a benefit uh, through their streams. You know, more people listening to their music, they're gaining new audiences. Uh, and, and again, much like I mentioned earlier, there's some of them are starting to chart or they're getting uh, uh, their first streams that they've ever gotten, as was the case for uh, two reggae musicians, uh, Beanie Man and Bounty Killer. Uh, they hadn't previously really charted on uh, in this social, you know, digital world of Apple Music and, and Spotify. But since that, they have, they have been. Um, so I, I, I think it's going to be a world in which uh, we add more depth and dimension and, and care and, and musicians and audience members will appreciate uh, each other's role in, in creating a sustainable, you know, music, uh, live music scene. I think that's a beautiful last answer to go off of. I think that adds a little bit of hope to this discussion as well. And if you want to write down the names of the reggae artists, I think everyone would be very interested to give them a listen. Um, with that, I'm going to open up the floor to the audience members. If they have any questions, you can drop them in the chat or use the raise hand function if you'd like. Oh, so from iPhone, we have what are the best ways to inspire yourself as a musician when you're losing motivation due to an unsupportive environment, i.e. people not responding well to the music you release? And anyone can answer if you'd like. Um, uh, music is subjective. Um, I, I would say you believe in your art. Um, take the criticism, though. Uh, use it as fuel. Um, you know, it's 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 going to happen where, you know, it's, it's as the artist, you are quote unquote, the product, right? Like, you know, the, the, the reaction, the response, the feedback is real time, uh, especially in the live, in the live sense. And, and sometimes that's harder to take, right. Versus, you know, completing a comment card and saying, Hey, you know, the dinner I was served last Monday was cold. You know what I mean? It's not having that same sting um, as, as an artist, but I think, you know, that, that should propel uh, any artist to really, you know, have a deep, deep look inside themselves if it's similar feedback that they're getting, and see, you know, how they can adapt um, and 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 pivot. I hate to use that word, but you know, pivot or you know, continue along your path and and believe in your art. Uh, most musicians uh, that I've been around, and even you know, as I was coming up. Uh, you're not going to get everyone that's going to like what you're doing or get what you're doing. Um, you know, Drake, not many people got what he was doing, right? Even when he put out his first album, he got a lot of negative feedback uh, about it. And if he had stopped now, I think my, my days in quarantine would have been, uh, you know, a little more down, to be quite honest. Um, you know, so I, I would say for artists, understand that you're going to get you know constructive criticism you might get some hard criticism um but that's part and parcel that's going to make you uh, a, a super talent uh and understand that uh you can inspire a, a, through your experience that's great yeah um if there are any other questions i mean i actually have a question myself which is like, I think there are so many people that are so passionate and talented about music in my life. And I'm very, I'm very interested in music as well. well. Not really from a performative sense. I'm really interested in music journalism. And it's a passion that I've been pursuing on the side of my education. But what made you take the plunge into turning music and going into the music industry a career versus passion that you've had? And again, open-ended for anyone. Charlotte, if you want to go, that'd be good. Um, yeah, like for, for me, it was never really a decision that I made. It just kind of, I was always going to do it. I was always like really, really passionate about music um, and came from a like an artistic family that like supported that. And so in that way, I was I, I was like privileged in the sense that I, I didn't have to like come up against barriers my I was like I want to do music and my parents were like great and <laughs> and so um yeah so it was just something that I always loved doing and then went on to study it and do it um 
and kind of have got my ass kicked along the way learning how hard and ridiculous it is at times. Um, but yeah, that's kind of been my two moves. Yeah, I mean, of course, like any life, big life decision comes with like its ups and downs, but I think music has it's such an intimate thing where it comes from, right? That creative process and it takes a lot of courage to share that with the world or like repeatedly and being like, I'm here, world love me. Um, <laughs> but thank you, that, that was really insightful. Um, yeah, uh, if there are no more questions, then... I think there are two questions actually. Oh, in the chat, uh, sorry. Yeah, there's one in the chat, um, it says, from Druva, it says, there have been some paid live streams by some artists during the pandemic, such as Billie Eilish and Gorillaz, do you think paid live streams are a sustainable source of income, especially for smaller upcoming artists? And again, open to anyone. I'm going to say no. I think I think I don't think they're a sustainable source of income. I think it's like can be one of those avenues where uh, maybe you can make some cash doing that. But from from what I've heard and seen. Um, because there are so many free live streams and the live streams that are happening are relatively inexpensive tickets. Um, I don't think it's, it's a, it'll, it'll be like a huge source of revenue for musicians. That's what I think. All right. Um, Michael has his hand up unless anyone else also wants to speak to, uh, Druva's question first. Uh, okay, well, just Michael, um, you can unmute yourself and ask whatever you want to ask. Yeah, um, hi guys, thank you guys so much for the panel. I really enjoyed it. Um, I was just wondering, so based on when you got started and like kind of your passions when you're younger and just when you started out in the music industry, do you think it's, you kind of maintain that same passion or do you guys think that your avenues have kind of changed into something different and something that keeps on motivating you? Uh, I'll speak to that. I think that's such a good question. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, so I would say everything changes. Like everything's constantly changing. Um, the industry is changing. <laughs> like even even since I like uh, you know left undergrad, if you want to call that the start of my career, my professional career in music. Um, like so much has changed since then. As we know from the past year absolutely everything that we thought we knew about, you know, has changed in the past year, right? Like I, nothing should surprise us now. <laughs> um, my role in music has changed so many times. I mean, I've worn so many hats, um, similar to all of the panelists, which I think, which actually is kind of like a, a point that I would make in terms of like, I feel like there's a previous question about like uh, making a career in music or something. Um, you know, one way to do that is like, to be and possibly arguably the only way to do that um, is you know with very few exceptions is to be able to be flexible and um, to be able to like take on a lot of different um, I mean some, something that like I feel like I'm I've constantly done not through any like previous strategy or anything is just like go to where I see a hole and fill it like see oh oh that needs to be done that's not being done I know how to do that okay then I start doing that okay, then I'm, I can start charging for doing this because I know how to do this thing because like so much of my career has been DIY, like truly like learning on the job, making, a, like, like faking it till I make it, like learning as I, and I, I really think that's true of so many people in this sector and many others. Um, so that's to say what I was passionate about, the type of like passion and drive I had maybe at like 20, is so different now, like the, the, what I understood as context then is so different than what it is now. What I'm doing now is so different than what I was doing then. Um, and, uh, you know, as Charlotte was saying, like getting my ass kicked every which way, like absolutely throughout in so many different ways. Um, and there are definitely like, you know, making a career in the arts is, is such that, yeah, absolutely. There are many days when, um, like the ROI does not really make dollar. I don't know how my other panelists feel about this, but like, I don't think like dollars and cents, it's ever really made sense. Um, I've, you know, I think if you can make a career in it, that's like, to me, I'm, I'm living, I can pay rent. I, like that to me is like, 
I feel like that's amazing. Like, and maybe I should set my, maybe I should set my standards higher, but I'm like, I'm killing it. Um, and, uh, and I think that's, that's sort of like, you know, if, that's, that's great. Um, personally, um, I think you, you can also like, you know, so you can also change your standards and like, but then you might have to be willing to do different kinds of things. Um, I have certain values that I've like set out to like uphold and I've been able to do that. Um, so yeah, so maybe to like cut myself some slack with the like, I'm not making tons and tons of money. That wasn't what I set out to do. Um, I set out to like support art that I thought was good and causes that I thought were good with people um, who I thought were making great things as well and sort of shared similar values. And I've been able to do that and I feel like that's great. Um, and uh, yeah, and then in terms of, um, but in terms of like what that core passion, like what excites me at the end of the day, that hasn't changed actually. Um, <laughs> I still care about the art in the same way now that I did way back then. And that's probably the only reason I'm still here because like I said, the ROI does not make sense. There's so many other things I could be doing for the number of hours and the amount of energy I put into this thing that could make me so much more money. Um, but uh, but this has been so rewarding uh, in other ways, and and those were choices that that I made. And um, and I'm also the kind of person who like I'm flexible. Like I'm totally like prepared to like would not be surprised if I wake up in ten years and say, you know what, I'm done with music. I'm like going in this direction. Like already, my career is sort of like moving away from music in some ways. And um, and I'm also like open to that. So that's just to say, like I've been someone who like can do this all of the time. And I've used that to my advantage to be able to survive. Um, but if I had different priorities, like, you know, <laughs> making a lot of money or like maybe more stability or something like that, then I, I might have, I might not have stayed as solidly in the industry as I did. But um, also in full admission, I wasn't intentionally trying to fully stay in the industry. I was just trying to follow the, the values that I, that I sort of like discussed. And, and that's sort of what's been driving me. And um, to me, I'm excited that I that I've been able to do that, and that in itself has has been a reward. Thank you so much for that answer, um, Amy. I think that was an amazing answer. That was really inspiring to hear, especially because we're all be graduating soon and deciding what we want to do with our lives professionally. And I think you won. You're doing what you're really passionate about, and you get you're like you said, you're upholding to your moral code. Um, and doing things that you think are right and you're living life that way. And I think, I think that's really good, inspiring. Um, just to move on to the last question from Emily. Some people talk about breaking into the industry is a lot about who you know, having connections, even at a local level. Could you guys speak to what extent that that's true and any experiences that might support or counter that? And do I see that you're unmuted? So you can go ahead. Yeah, I mean, uh, so Amy, you are killing it, uh, by the way. Um, but to dovetail off of what Amy was saying, um, a lot of it is is DIY. It's getting into spaces. It's networking. It's it's um, yeah. It, it could be a lot about who you know and who they know. Um, uh, obviously, you 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 have to uh, have a skill set, um, a want, a need, uh, and and just have a strength um, uh, within the music industry to make yourself. Uh, fit and stay and um, be a part of this. But absolutely, I mean, my career probably wouldn't be where it is if um, I didn't have a, a network, if I didn't have, if I didn't create a network. And, and uh, you know, much like, you know, my, my fellow panelists have said, I, I didn't set out to stay in the music industry. Well, I did set out to stay in the music industry, but I'll, you know, I, I've quit several times, quote unquote, quit, walked away, um, you know, but it's pulled me back. That passion that Amy was talking about uh, has pulled me back. And, and, and a lot of it was about the inequities, the barriers, you know, the fact that, yes, it is about who you know and, and, and who, who, who they know. Um, so how do we fill that gap? How do we fill that void? How do we make, uh, you know, a pathway, you know, from those who are, are graduating and know what they want to do and they want to get into the music industry, but it's so competitive. <laughs> What is that first next step? And that, the initial passion I had for music um, to express myself transitioned a little bit to close these gaps, you know, find a way 
to make it more accessible, um, to remove those systemic barriers. And um, so that that's what has kind of propelled me. And, and it a lot of it was through who I've known and who I've met throughout the years. Volunteering um, was, was very big at the onset of my career. Uh, I did not set out to be an arts administrator, uh, but for the better part of 10, you know, last decade or so, that's, that's who I've been. Um, you know, trying to help uh, a generation of artists, you know, uh, support their career sustainable, sustainably through, through their art uh, and, and find different ways of doing that. So yeah, um, that's, that's, that's how I've dealt with it for sure. If there's anyone that would like to answer as well. If not, um, that was an incredibly great answer. Thank you so much, Dwayne. I think what you're doing is something to be really proud of. And there's so many people that are grateful for that trans and the pathway that you're opening and filling, the, filling those gaps. Um, so just to finish off, this has been an incredibly interesting discussion. And I think everyone here today has learned a lot about artists adapting to what is honestly a complete curveball of a period in the music industry. In times of crisis like these, it's always the arts that we go to for comfort and a sense of connection with others like our favorite songs and artists. With that, I hope to encourage everyone here to continue to support the arts and encourage growth and creation like today. Most importantly, I'd like to thank our panelists, Charlotte, Duane, and Amy, our senior advisor, Eli, whose hard work brought this all together, and my co-moderator, co Zane. And on behalf of HHMC, thank you for sharing your expertise and time with us in guiding this conversation. Thank you to Heart House, the committee members who worked hard to put this event together. And of course, thank you, our audience, for joining us today. We hope that you had a very engaging and thought-provoking discussion. And just to finish off, if you enjoyed tonight's chat, Please get excited for Demos 2021 Spirit Edition issue coming out next week. And um, for HHMC, our last open mic of the year is on the 31st, which is going to be co-hosted by a local band called Push and Daisies. Uh, and with that, thank you guys very much. This was very, very fun. Uh, I could end the meeting now or... I just wanted to thank uh, Dwayne, Charlotte, and Amy so much for this. This was it was great to hear all of your insights and um, <clears throat> and and thanks to the Hart House Student Music Committee for just showing such incredible enthusiasm about this idea. This is really this was your idea, and I was um, happy to support it in any way I can. So um, thanks to everyone who was involved in this. This was great. Yeah, thank you so much, guys. I really enjoyed uh, the discussion. It was super insightful. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks yeah, so much. Thanks so much.